Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Victoria Wilson. I'm a dental therapist and the founder of The Smile Revolution, which is an oral health promotional entity that produces content to support the dental profession's advancements and separate content to support the public's oral health. And my work with Biomin began following on from a podcast recording I did with Robert Hill and Richard Watley recently. And my children actually now use Biomin F for kids, the new children's toothpaste. So the objective of today is to address children's oral health from a global perspective, ranging from policy to clinical work. And we will also be looking into one aspect of how children's oral health can be improved through a new technology incorporated into children's toothpaste, Biomin F for kids. So moving on to our panelists, I have the pleasure of being accompanied by a hugely impressive group of panelists today with extensive biographies, all of which are accessible on the Biomin website events page. So without further ado, here's a short introduction of our eminent panelists in the order of which they will be appearing today. So firstly, we have Sir Paul Beresford, an extremely experienced dentist and politician who is the Member of Parliament for Mole Valley in the southeast of England. Secondly, we have Miss Emma Pacey, dental therapist and educationalist with a special interest in dental public health. Thirdly, Dr. Nigel Carter, an eminent figure in the promotion of oral health and dental care and CEO of the Oral Health Foundation. And fourth, we have Professor Ferranti Wong, an internationally regarded specialist in caries prevention and D and remineralization with novel biomaterials and Professor of Pediatric Dentistry at Queen Mary University, London. Chief Scientific Officer of Biomin Technologies, who is Chair of Physical Science in the Dental Institute at Queen Mary University London and is an award-winning expert in bioactive glass and appetite chemistry. So now moving on to our questions. Firstly, as mentioned, we have Sir Paul Beresford. So, Sir Paul, this, these questions are all for you. So, firstly, as a member of parliament and a dentist, you are well positioned for policy. Please explain the government's concerns regarding children's oral health. Fortunately, it's improved dramatically. Over the years, when I ceased to become a minister and became backbench, I was able to promote dentistry, especially child dental health. We've had a number of debates in the House with people from the Labour Party and the Tory Party promoting the fact that children's health is lacking, that the figures are appalling. Uh, there are about 160 operations every single day in England for five to nine-year-olds in hospital for extractions, and that's costing about £836 per individual per time. Set aside the pain for the kids, the pain and difficulties for the parents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. A lot of it is related mostly to poor education. And when I was working first in this country in East London, I was astonished at the appalling state of children's teeth, uh, related to some degree to dieting, also, or diet, sorry, not dieting, um, but also to the fact that many kids didn't have toothbrushes and they didn't have uh, toothpaste, obviously. This is changing, and it's just as well, because until recently, and perhaps even now, most dentists have felt England was a, in England, that dentistry was a Cinderella service, but it's changing now. And Sarah Hurley, who's the recently appointed, or relatively recently appointed Chief Dental Officer, is on a huge campaign targeting children's dental health. And she's starting to succeed. She's got a rather a good mantra, put the mouth back into the body, which I think is a very good way of putting it. 
and the response from ministers has been really quite helpful. She's had the support of many charities, MPs, health ministers, even dentists and dental practices to put in an increasing drive to teach toothbrushing in primary schools. And that's really starting to work. Uh, in addition to that, uh, Sarah Hurley, Prof Lennon of the British Fluidation Society and I have met with Matt Hancock on just this subject. And we are pushing heavily, not only for what Sarah is doing and everybody's doing with her, but to get fluoride into the water supply. Fluoride in the water supply in this country is pathetic. It's about 10% of the water supplies that will be available. Most countries like, and this covers one of your other questions, Australia, New Zealand, United States, Canada, they have 60, 70, 80% of their water supplies fluoridated. Fluoridation is, I hope, going to become one of the policies that have been pushed forward I'll stop at that to get to your next question. Okay, Paul, thank you so much. Um, so yes, moving on, how does Britain compare to the rest of the world regarding children's oral health? About middling, I would say. The point on fluoride, I think, is really valid. Uh, those countries that have fluoridated water supply up to a high proportion have better child dental health. But there are other aspects, and if I could let my accent slip out and go back to New Zealand, New Zealand has a system where they have dental therapists in clinics in all of the major primary schools, and every child gets a checkup, every child gets uh, fillings when required, etc. Uh, we haven't got that here. The advantage in New Zealand is once fluoride came in, the numbers of children that need treatment has diminished so that the dental nurses, as they're called, therapists, have gone over to teaching oral hygiene. And that is starting to make an increasing difference. And I'm hoping we're going to get that here. Thank you. Yes. Um, and how do you feel things have changed over the course of your career? The recognition of the importance of fluoride is slowly coming to the thinking members of the public and those that are concerned. There is still resistance. Uh, every time I mention fluoride in the House of Commons, I get a letter in shaky pur purple handwriting from Chile to tell me I've got it wrong. The handwriting's got shakier and shakier and it suddenly stops. So I think the Great Reaper has done me a job. The um, hope now is that now we've got Sarah Hurley there and now we've got two ministers that's Joe Churchill and Matt on board that once this little epidemic that seems to be devastating everybody comes to conclusion if we can get it to conclusion we can then get on with introducing fluoride speeding up the uh, oral hygiene and perhaps I'd quite like to use a biomin tests so that we can have some schools using biomin, some not, and see exactly what happens if we can get the dental surgeries nearby to cooperate. Sarah's on for that. Well, that's, yeah, interesting. It's certainly interesting to explore. And um, what is the current burden on the British economy regarding preventable oral health care, particularly in children? It's quite high. Uh, and it's depressing because it does not have to be high because caries is universally uh, preventable. Uh, Sarah and I would like to arrange for a, and aim for a target of 100% uh, removal of, but it's unrealistic. But when you recognise that 25% of all five-year-olds in England experience tooth decay in at least three to four percent, three to four teeth. And in deprived areas, that goes up from 25 to 50 percent. That more than 45,000 people, young people, children, young people between zero and 19 years, have gone into hospital for extractions for tooth decay. This includes 26,000 five to nine year olds. You begin to see exactly the damage it's doing to the NHS budget, and it's unnecessary damage that we could get over. Absolutely. Now, you, you've briefed on, you know, what you're currently working on um, with our Chief Dental Officer, Sarah Hurley, and what you've spoken to Matt Hancock about. But what is the current government strategy to address children's oral health moving forward? They've 
Sara is going to have to work on the systems to encourage, and she's working on a different system of payment to try to encourage more dental surgeries to see children. I'm cutting this very short. We've got, in addition, the drive that SARA and charities and MPs, MPs in the local area and the local councils are driving for to have toothbrushing. And as far as I can manage it, we will be looking towards toothbrushing and oral hygiene and so forth for very young kids. This has an added advantage that when you have very young children, the mothers or fathers, predominantly mothers, turn up and you can actually ask them whether they've actually got a toothbrush. And from the halitosis at some of the meetings, I think some of them haven't. Uh, this will be, and I touched on this, an opportunity to test biomen against others and see how we go and get adoption of it. But it's going to be, in addition to that, the campaign is now behind dentistry. Matt accepts the importance of dentistry. Joe Churchill accepts the importance of dentistry. Sarah is campaigning. And if we can get fluoride progressively into the water supplies throughout the country, we could head for a very, very high preventative program. Well, let's hope very much for the fact that this is going to be successful and so many elements that you've spoken about get implemented and, and take off. So thank you so much to Paul Beresford um, for answering my questions today. So now moving on to Emma Pacey. Um, Emma, what concerns do you have regarding children's oral health at present? Yes. Um, I mean, I think probably um, sort of kicking off most recently, um, we had the publication of the National Oral Health Survey of five-year-olds, um, which found oral health improvement to have plateaued. And so, you know, we currently have a situation where on average, almost one in four of our five-year-olds experience decay, and those that have it on average 3.4 teeth were affected. Um, and the trajectory from three-year-olds um, is steep with decay experience you know, sort of doubling. Um, it's largely preventable, of course, as we know. Um, and so the question really is, is whether we value the oral health of children in our society. And if we do, what we're going to do to tackle it. Um, evidently, you know, we all know the pain, distress, disturbed eating, sleeping, working, um, you know, the way in which dent decay experience impacts. But it also follows a pattern um, that tracks overweight obesity. Um, and so in other words, those with decay experience are also more likely to be overweight obese. And so arguably uh, tackling it is, is even more important. And, and these risk factors are, um, you know, we know they're not easy to address. If they were, we've had a, we'd have a handle on them and we wouldn't have seen a plateauing um, in health improvement or oral health improvement. Um, we need to acknowledge, I think, you know, and, and this has been alluded to already by Sir Paul, that the current system is no longer fit for purpose and understand better our complex health behaviour and, and come together to tackle them in a coordinated approach. Specifically in relation to COVID and concerns, I, I can possibly speak collectively and say that there is additional concern. Everyone's daily routines have been disrupted, income affected and priorities shifted, which impact, of course, the way we're able to care for ourselves and specifically the food we eat and our daily hygiene practice. And this, of course, has been compounded by the withdrawal of primary care. Um, in secondary care, of course, we have seen less people attending, even where um, the provision has, been, has remained open. And by extension, again, I think it's fair to say there are concerns being expressed about what impact this will have on the rate of GAs being provided for dental decay. And Sir Paul's already mentioned, so I won't you know, re reiterate the fact there. Um, but most importantly, I think poor oral health, like general health, is an issue of inequality. And arguably, that is the greatest risk factor for both infectious disease, i.e. COVID, um, as well as NC, you know, non-communicable diseases such as dental decay. And it is increasingly becoming a conversation that we're having nationally and internationally. Um, and the pandemic has seen this surge. And I think it provides an opportunity that we can monopolise on in terms of that conversation. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you there, Emma. Um, and what are you currently working on to overcome these? Okay, so, I mean, I split my week between Health Education England and King's College Hospital. At Health Education England, you, know, you may well be aware, we work to ensure the healthcare workforce is reflective of the health needs of our population and that it's agile in its response to this. And I'm sure you can appreciate that COVID has probably presented our steepest, indeed the NHS, the 
NHS's rather steepest learning curve to date. Um, so we've obviously seen, uh, in terms of what I've been up to recently, mass remobilisation of the workforce to support the COVID response for, you know, example into transferable roles within NHS trusts to Nightingale Hospitals, NHS 111, Track and Trace. Um, but we are now returning from crisis management to sort of the new normal, so to speak. Um, and this is centred on training. And in our region, um, I'm based in London, Kent, Surrey, Sussex. Um, we uh, are year on year increasing our public health offer and mobilising the substantial sort of dental workforce that we have in a sustainable uh, way across the life course. And this, of course, includes children, you know, in terms of interventions at that, that age group. Um, in terms of um, my work at King's, we're commissioned to promote oral health across nine local authorities. Um, and we're currently mapping out how this will look in the COVID context. Um, in terms of young children's oral health, and again, this reflects uh, some of what Sir Paul has said, um, some of the population level interventions um, have had to be paused due to the risk of disease transmission. And this is just temporarily, such as supervised toothbrushing. Um, so, you know, at the moment, we're looking to reorientate our offer and focus on lower risk interventions, such as distributing oral health packs and working in coordination with other initiatives, such as food banks and voucher and supplementary schemes. And since the announcement of free school meals over the summer holidays, we've been exploring opportunity there, too, to piggyback on that. Um, a large part of our current focus, as I'm sure you can appreciate, is how to deliver health promotion virtually in an impactful way, which does mark a gear change from how we have historically really engaged communities, particularly those that are um, on the fringes, so to speak, um, face to face. But at the same time, this change does provide opportunity. Absolutely. And I think that's what we're going with, isn't it? And um, exciting opportunities of how we can move forward. So what challenges do you see arising? You've, you've gone over a few aspects of it, but associated to the number of actual appointments um, missed resulting from lockdown and COVID-19. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I think sort of priority really is the long term health consequences and the reduced, you know, due to the reduced access to care or rather focusing on that aspect of your question. Um, I think a concern there again is that the um, reduced access does disproportionately affect deprived communities mm -hmm. um, and additionally you know safeguarding opportunities are, are reduced mm -hmm. um, but now of course primary care is opening up um, and between primary and secondary care um, we're really uh, tackling you know the extensive waiting lists um, and prioritizing in the process which I think is a new decision sort of making process that we're entering into really um, COVID, I think, uh, you know, as we've already alluded to, but it has pushed us to our limits, and, but it's also showcased the value and transferability in our skill sets. And I think mm -hmm. also brought into stark relief what constitutes necessary care and the need to, need to wide, widen access to the public. And in that, I'm thinking about skill mix, again, to reflect on something that Sir Paul's just said. So I think what's interesting is what it has taught us and what we can learn to take forward. So for example, you know, what is a risk assess pro, um, recall and how best can we utilize the whole team to widen access? The current system, as we know, does present barriers to this. Sure. How we can engage our patients in behavior change. You know, as I said, whether or not we can deliver, how we can deliver oral health education virtually, and what you know, current evidence-based procedures can we provide in a low-risk environment because the fast hand piece has been put down. And I have further comment to make on that, but I won't in the interest of time, and that this is possibly treading on far more eminent individual who's coming up, and I've no doubt we'll be covering that. So, yeah, but I mean, the good news is that we can provide, I think it's fair to say, the majority of um, evidence-based care in a in an, a no AGP environment. Yeah, well, Emma, thank you so much for everything that you've shared in your answers there. Um, you've covered so much, um, and thank you so much. Um, and now moving on to Nigel Carter. Um, the Oral Health Foundation is a global organisation. What initiatives are you working on from a national and a global standpoint? And how will these help to improve children's oral health, Nigel? Well, we're working on a number of initiatives. Uh, I think uh, many people listening will be aware of our National Smile Month, which has been running in the UK now for uh, some 43, 44 years. Uh, we're looking at ways that we can extend that on an international basis. 
um, with Mouth Cancer Action Month, not particularly applicable to children, but uh, we're actually entering into an arrangement where that's going to be spread across Europe. So our international activity uh, is increasing and we've had a lot of work around um, COVID return to practice in terms of some uh, nice uh, graphic guidelines that we've adapted from the French Dental uh, Association and are widely distributing worldwide. They're being taken up in the States as well. Um, clearly, one of the things that we're very keen on, and I, I'm delighted that Paul uh, is confirming the fact that there is at last real interest in water fluoridation. And this, I think, is going to be one of the single things that can most transform child oral health. Uh, I had the good fortune to work through my practicing life uh, in Birmingham. And one of my first practices was on the borders of Birmingham, which was then fluoridated, and Sanwell, which wasn't. Uh, and we could literally tell when children came in, and fluoride was in toothpaste at the time, so this was an additive effect. When children came in through the door and we looked at their oral health, we charted them, uh, the ones with cavities invariably came from Sandwell, and the ones who hadn't got cavities came from Birmingham. If we had a child turn the card over, saw it was a Birmingham child, and they were experiencing decay, the question to the mother was, oh, it's a very strange little Johnny's got decay and you live in Birmingham. The 100% answer was, oh, we've only just moved into the area. So it really is going to be a huge step forwards and a huge health benefit to look at uh, fluoridation. And that's a, a campaign that uh, we're increasingly going to be uh, supporting and, and promoting. Yeah. Thank you, Nigel. Um, what surveys are being undertaken to look at the impact of COVID-19 on children's oral health specifically? I haven't seen specifically looking at children's oral health. I mean, this is, it's going to be more of a problem with children than it has been with um, adults. Uh, because the rate of progression of decay is so much quicker uh, in a child population. So with adults really not being able to attend for routine examination and the odd filling or replacement of fillings over a three, four month period and reduced levels of access to dental care is not going to be as key as it is with children. So I think as dental practices return to normal practice, there is going to be a need to prioritise children. Um, they're clearly going to be under pressure from everybody to see them, but children are going to need to be uh, prioritised because if they are left for longer, uh, the consequences are going to be larger for that child population than for the adult population. No, absolutely. Um, and it's got to be a focus, hasn't it? Um, and now, in regards to the Oral Health Foundation's accreditation programme, it's widely regla regarded globally, Nigel. Um, can you explain why this validation is so important for dental products and what does it demonstrate to consumers? It's very much from our point of view, it's a consumer-focused campaign and it is to protect the consumer uh, against bogus claims or exaggerated claims being made on products. So it's a claims-based process. We have a totally independent academic panel uh, who actually sit and look at uh, a portfolio of evidence on the product to justify the marketing claims that are being made. And we've all seen in the past the, the sort of really bizarre claims that have been made for some products. You know, seven shades whiter in a week for a whitening toothpaste, which clearly is not supportable by any form of uh, scientific research. So one of the things that we aim to do with the campaign is really make sure that the public can be reassured when they see the foundation accreditation logo on a pack, that the claims are justified and that they're not being uh, sold over exaggerated claims and a product that doesn't work and doesn't say what it, it doesn't do what it says it does. 
Sure. Thank you for the clarification there. And Nigel, in terms of motivation, how can we drive greater work outside of a practice setting for improved oral health? I think this is going to be key to the future. I think we have a unique opportunity here with the pause that we've had to practice. Uh, we've, we've spoken slightly earlier on about the move to remote consultations. I think these are going to change. This is going to give us greater access to patients, perhaps in between appointments, to be reinforcing remotely their oral hygiene and oral health regimes. Um, we're currently looking at trying to launch a campaign to encourage dentists to take this time where they have no output related requirements uniquely uh, in the history of the NHS. Uh, during this period, dentists are not being paid to drill and fill. So they have a unique opportunity to step back from their normal practice and move towards a preventive model, which we all know is the future, but which the system has been constrained against us delivering. So I think uh, we have a, a real opportunity out of this crisis to really move things forward, put prevention centre in the agenda, both for the public on the outside, because they know they've got challenges in uh, getting through to dental practices, and for the practitioners themselves to change towards a, a preventive and outcomes related model, rather than the output related model that they've had in the past. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, Nigel. So thank you so much for answering my questions there. And now moving on to Ferranti Wong. Um, as an expert clinician in paediatric dentistry, what do you see as the biggest problem facing children's oral health and what impact does this have on both children and society? Well, as you said, as clinicians, is we have a different view with the public um, of things happening. The biggest impact, I would say that, you know, as you can see, I'm going to show some horrible pictures as Richard is going to go through them. Let's have a first slide. Okay, the first slide you can see is a horrible pictures, you know, of a child, which I personally see quite a lot, over 30 years working in pediatric dentistry. We're still seeing exactly the same thing over and over and over again. Now, I know that, you know, sir, Paul has quite rightly said that the oral health of children has improved, but then Emma said that under five is still continue to increase, and over the 30 years of child dental survey, the under five has not changed very much, and this is the kind of thing that we see. Next slide, please, Richard. I mean, I think people have quoted that 25% of the under five is still have dental decay. Next slide, please. And then we know that the dental decay does not only affect the child, but then they also, not only on the pain and things like that, they affect their learning ability. Look at the schooling they miss. Look at that, the amount of time that the parents have to uh, take off work and the societal cause for dealing with what we have been said many, many times a preventable disease that, you know, society pay for it, the child suffer for it, the education they're going to be um, uh, so, uh, suffer as well. I think it's quite a big impact on that. Number four, please. And also, as we said, that the under five, as what Royal College of London, uh, England said, that about the increase, not only they have tooth extraction, a number of them who come to our hospital is that to have extraction under general anesthetic. It's not only one tooth, but more than one tooth, they're going to have them extracted as well. So even though with so-called improvement dental health, it's not improved enough and still a large amount of the preschool children are being affected by this dental caries and dental decay that we are coming in contact with. Yeah. I mean, you've highlighted there some of the issues facing children's oral health, but what is the solution and how do we overcome these? Well, as um, 
Uh, next slide, please. As we know that it's always you know, prevention, prevention, and prevention. And people think talk about prevention can be divided into three parts, primary, secondary, and tertiary. And it can apply to different people in different ways. I would like to use the three R, which I just you know, think of. is to resist the decay, the, the decay first or to protect it, to repair once we have that, whether it's initial, whether it's uh, later on, or at the end, something we do not move, we don't want to remove them. Of course, the prevention is based on the first two, either primary or secondary or to resist or repair. Next slide, please. Of course, that you know the uh, best practice and the two kids that we're talking about is that there is obviously the one that talking about dietary advice and then the brush teeth twice daily and then going to see the dentist. And Sarah Hurry, I think continue to push on because care is a multifactorial. But we know that the um, changing people's dietary behavior is a big cultural change, a big cultural behavioral change. Going to dentist at, the, at least at this moment is about drilling and filling. It's not something that which we would like to do. But looking at the whole of the concept, even you can see the bottom line, is that to brush the teeth, if you can click that now, Richard, and is the main thing that we are talking about is brush the teeth as frequently, at least no, uh, twice daily, with a fluoride toothpaste. Now, the only thing about that fluoride toothpaste has been with us since the 1960s. But is it the only thing that we can use? I have got much doubt and also limitations about that as well. Yeah. So you mentioned there are limitations with the current recommendations regarding um, the toothpaste and what's included um, within, I guess, our guidelines for prevention from uh, Public Health England. And you say um, the standards of toothpaste aren't necessarily 100% effective. So what improvements in toothpaste would you like to see that would bring added benefits in the prevention of decay in children's teeth? Um. Just not misunderstanding, I did not say fluoride is bad. Okay, fluoride is good, has done a really, really good job for a long time. Next sure. slide. But in a very, very sort of um, simplistic form, we know that enamel is made up of hydrous appetite, which is calcium phosphate uh, compound on that. Most of the nowadays, the commercial toothpaste we're using is based on sodium fluoride and only give you the way of having the calcium and phosphate to form hydrous appetite using the ingredient within the saliva. But saliva distribution is changing from people to people and then from place to place. The distribution is not the same in everywhere within the mouth system as well. So I think that's why Bowman has been to deal that it not only has got fluoride, it's got a calcium and phosphate ingredient within it, which can then provide the ingredient to resist, by, uh, sorry, to resist, which is that to neutralize the acid attack. And also, if you can see the left-hand picture, the initial carous lesions, it can also remineralize. I think the interesting thing is that the calcium and phosphate and even fluoride are incorporated into a glass structure, which I hope that, you know, Robert Hill is going to talk about, and it's a slow releasing rather than having it, you know, just come there and be washed away. And the other thing that which, you know, sometimes we do see in clinic as well, I know that a lot of people talk about fluoridation, although now I fully support it myself, but there are people who are against fluoride as well. So next slide, please. So I, the people who still think that might be a minority of a community, still think that fluoride can be poisonous by having the calcium and phosphate within the toothpaste might be just enough to tip the balance in order to resist and also to repair any caries lesion which has been produced by acidic attack. Yeah. So 
I mean, you've discussed the importance of remineralization properties here. I mean, what, which are not commonly found, you know, in standard toothpaste aside from decay, what other problems do you encounter within your clinical setting where a bioactive toothpaste such as Biomin F for kids may provide therapeutic benefit? Well, the thing that we talk about carries in a major majority of things, and we are talking about it most of the time, and then, but also, there are some people, not because of their fault, not because of diet and things like that, they have developmental decay, sometimes we call it MIH or enamel uh, hypermineralization, which is defective in the enamel mineral. That can also cause hypersensitivity. The ingredient, I mean, the, we can use four virus and things that we don't find it very, very effective in this way. Anecdotally, when we advise people to use the biomine with the calcium and phosphate ingredient within that, we found that the hypersensitivity is decreased. It might not repair the enamel defect if they got a quantitative effect rather than qualitative effect, but at least it reduced the hypersensitivity. And that makes me, as a clinician, to repay it much, much easier because some of the sensitivity is so much that even no kinesthetic, does not seem to work. So the balming toothpaste might be able to help out even in this kind of defect uh, in the clinic as well. Yeah, thank you so much for Auntie for answering my questions there. Um, now moving on to Robert Hill. So, so far we've talked about the issues surrounding children's oral health, but now we move on to the importance of children's toothpaste in combating many of these issues. What is the benefit of a bioactive glass toothpaste like Biominef for kids? And can you please briefly explain the science behind bioactive glass? Okay, thank you, Victoria. Um, uh, the, the, the bioactive glass is quite interesting because it, it it's, contains calcium and phosphate within the glass structure and uh, it dissolves slowly with time. Uh, so as, as the glass uh, dissolves, it releases the calcium and phosphate and, and the conventional uh, bioglasses form hydroxycarbonated apatite, which is the tooth mineral. They're generally not referred to as glasses by the manufacturer. They're referred to as Novamin or, or a calcium phosphosilicate. And for example, the Sensodyne uh, Repair and Protect contains a bioactive glass in it. Uh, we have the next slide, Richard. Uh, in the mouth, um, calcium and phosphate and hydroxyl ions are in dynamic equilibrium with the appetite uh, of the tooth enamel. Um, so we have on the, 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 in the green box over on the right there, we have the enamel, uh, appetite CA5PO43. Uh, uh, and in the saliva, um, we have the calcium, the phosphate, and the hydroxyl ions. So when the hydroxyl ion concentration reduces because of acid erosion or caries, uh, this equilibrium moves to the left. So in other words, we lose tooth mineral. Um, if we push the pH back up, i.e. we increase the hydroxyl ion concentration, we can move that equilibrium back towards the right in terms of the appetite formation and we can remineralize the tooth. Um, but of course, we can do this not only by raising the pH, but also by providing calcium and phosphate ions, which will also push that balance uh, from the left to the right in favor of remineralization. But one of the best things we can do uh, is to provide some fluoride ions and these fluoride ions replace the hydroxyl ions uh, and we form fluorapatite rather than hydroxyapatite or hydroxycarbonated apatite. And fluorapatite is about a unit of pH uh, more stable um, to acids than hydroxyapatite. We have the next slide, which is the next question. Yeah. So uh, uh, Professor Tenkarte recommended low level fluoride with calcium over a controlled period of time. Can you please expand on the mechanism of biomin and its remineralization properties? Okay, so Professor Tenkarte was one of the experts on, on caries. He's retired now. 
But what he recognized was that you only needed low concentration of fluoride to have a beneficial effect on enamel and dentine remineralization. Um, but what he recognized was after brushing your teeth with a fluoride toothpaste, such as sodium fluoride, then because of salivary flow in the mouth, uh, the fluoride concentration decays away in an exponential fashion. So it's, it's following the green dots on the diagram on the right there. Um, and this is not really what you want. What you want is, is a low fluoride concentration over a sustained time period. If you like, you can get this also to a degree from water fluoridation. Um, but what he recognized was for treatments to be effective longer than the brushing and the salivary fluoride clearance, fluoride needs to be deposited and slowly released. And if we have the next slide, please. Uh, um, and this is what the Biomin F does. Uh, but in order for the glass particles in the toothpaste not to be washed away, uh, we have to, uh, pr pr to uh, couple them to the tooth surface uh, in a temporary way. And, and we use a polymer in the toothpaste called polyacrylic acid. And this chemically bonds to the calcium in the enamel and the calcium in the biomin particle. And it serves to stick the particles to the tooth surface and prevent them being washed away by salivary flow. The polymer in the toothpaste is exactly the same polymer that is used in a glass on a cement uh, and for the set, essentially the same purpose, to provide adhesion. And if we go to the, the, the next slide now, um, one of the, the, the big factors with children is they tend to have a grazing eating style, right? I know my, my granddaughters uh, all tend to snack between meals and drink between meals. And one of the problems with this sort of grazing habit is each time you take a sugary drink or an acid drink into the mouth, the pH drops. Uh, and it might take two or three hours sometimes for the pH to come back above seven. Uh, and if you can continue to graze or, 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 or drink throughout the day, then the pH remains on the acid side for prolonged periods. And this is what causes the uh, tooth decay. Um, and one of the great advantages of the, the, the biomin, the bioactive glass, is that as it dissolves, it actually raises the pH. And it actually dissolves faster when the pH is lower. So it's a smart uh, material, you would say. But it's also, rather than forming the hydroxycarbonated appetite as a conventional bioblast would, it forms fluorapatite, which is about a unit of pH more stable to acids. So that's the blue line um, in the diagram. So it pushes the critical pH from the orange line of about 5.5 uh, to about 4.5. And that has a major benefit. Yeah. Uh, one of the downsides with COVID is, is that the consumption of sugary drinks and of crisps, for example, are 25 to 30 percent increased during the last three months. I'm sure. Um, but I guess uh, something else that we'd like to cover is another relatively common concern in paediatric dentistry is fluorosis. So how can Biomin help? Okay, so if we move on to the next slide, um, one of the, if you have too much fluoride, uh, you will tend to have a, 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 a mottled, opaque regions or, or in the enamel. Um, and this is due to high fluoride concentrations. Uh, one of the advantages of the, the, the Biomin F toothpaste is because we're using the fluoride in, in a smarter way, uh, by a slow release mechanism, we can actually have a, 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 a caries preventative uh, effect at much lower fluoride contents. So the fluoride content in the Biomin F it, it is only about 540 parts per million compared with a conventional toothpaste at 1450 ppm. Mm. So by dropping the fluoride content, this will help in preventing fluorosis. Sure. Um, 
And Biomin F, Biomin has a range of different products, the most well-known being Biomin F. What is the difference between Biomin F and the Biomin F for kids, your new children's toothpaste? Okay, if we have the next slide, Richard. The, the Biomin F for children has the same active ingredient as the, the Biomin F toothpaste for adults. Um, uh, it, it has the same fluoride containing bioactive glass in it at the same loading. The difference comes in the flavors. Uh, most children don't like uh, particularly strong minty flavors. Uh, they like flavors like strawberry, for example, or melon. Uh, and it, so it comes in strawberry and melon flavors. It, it also has, if you like, child-friendly packaging. Uh, it also has a range of, of things to go with it. You can download from the website. So you can have coloring sheets, stickers, uh, and a brushing chart. And all these make it much more attractive and fun for the children to use. Sure. And in the UK, we refer to the Delivering Better Oral Health Toolkit, a higher soluble fluoride content in comparison to that found in Biomin F. How do you respond to some people's concerns here? Okay, so if you, um, one of the problems with the, uh, the Cochrane reviews, for example, on fluoride, look at fluoride alone. Um, and until relatively recently, we really only had fluoride containing toothpastes um, without any sort of calcium and phosphate uh, uh, releasing properties. And if you want to make most effective use of the, of the fluoride, you really need a source of calcium and phosphate. Uh, and you also want to be able to push that pH up. Um, we've measured in the laboratory uh, the, the remineralizing rates of, of various toothpastes. Um, and if you look at this figure here, for example, um, over on the, the, the right, we have artificial saliva. Artificial saliva saliva itself can remineralize uh, um, uh, enamel, uh, de demineralized enamel. And that contains no fluoride, but of course it's got calcium and phosphate in. Um, but if you look at the, the figures there, um, the Sensodyne Repair and Protect, for example, which has got 1450 ppm fluoride, if fluoride was the only factor, that ought to be giving us the highest remineralization rate, but it's not. Um, uh, things like MI paste, for example, has no fluoride in it, but has a comparable remineralization rate to the Sensodyne Repair and Protect. Um, the Biomin F, because it delivers calcium and phosphate in fairly large amounts, and fluoride, gives us the highest uh, uh, remineralization rate. So I, I really don't think, in, in a sense, the the guidelines are, 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 are good guidelines to have when you're looking at fluoride contents of toothpaste, providing it's just sodium fluoride. Um, but where you've got other species actively involved in remineralization and caries prevention, I, I, I think there are some deficiencies to the guidelines. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Robert, um, for answering my questions and to each of the panelists for answering the questions that I've posed today. Um, we've now got some time to answer some questions. And um, I'd like to pose the first one to you, Emma. Um, in regards to uh, motivation of children and engagements to mothers, what are your thoughts on how we can motivate children and engage the mothers more? Um, I think first and foremost, um, our interaction has to be positively framed. So certainly no scare tactics. Um, we might talk about them on our side of the fence, but you know, not necessarily the best way to engage um, families in terms of behavior change. And I think important that um, our advice is pragmatic to build capability, you know, in terms of their personal skills and empathetic, you know, and this um, really um, what we're talking about is motivational interviewing techniques, which is broadly what sits behind delivering better oral health chapter 10 on helping people change their behavior, you know, important to acknowledge and reflect their priorities and what we're advising. Um, obviously we're fortunate to have the opportunity to, um, 
usually um, spend uh, more than one meeting with um, people. So, you know, it's about prioritizing mm. messages and, and drip feeding them. Um, crucially too, though, I think going back to what we were talking about, the um, impact um, on general health as well, that the same risk factors um, within oral health um, pose, I think pointing out that what's good for teeth is good for tummies, piggybacks, sort of on the current um, broader health promotion messages from Change for Life, etc. Um, so your messages almost land in context um, and encourage belief that behaviour change will have an impact that goes beyond oral health, because we know that for some people, um, that's not enough to engage them as such. Um, in terms of community, sort of at the community level, and this is, again, I suppose, reflecting a little bit on what some of the other panellists have talked about, um, there's obviously lots of really great work going on um, to inspire engagement. Um, so, you know, working with your local partners, and I'm talking about local dental teams, you know, on the ground in primary care, um, including the wider healthcare team. So for example, um, pharmacists that might work on your doorstep, as well as education workforces to really try and promote the oral health messages and make every contact count when people are um, presenting to other um, you know, allied professionals. Um, as are schemes that engage children in oral health and daily activity. So obviously we've got um, the London Mayor's um, Healthy Early Years London um, initiative, which embeds oral health in education settings in ways such as supervised toothbrushing, for example. Um, and then we've also obviously got NHS uh, sort of starting well, the Smile for Life initiative, which actively encourages dental practices to be promoting and offering dental check by one, uh, tangibly supporting families with tools for oral health. And we know that's key. You know, it is not simply about giving advice. It's about supporting people through that behavior change once we've had that initial conversation um, and really work to, like I say, engage with who's on your um, local doorstep so that we're not operating in a silo as such. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, Emma. And it is utilizing everybody within our community settings to spread that message as much as possible. Thank you so much, Emma. Um, now, this question um, I've received is for Sir Paul Beresford. Um, so Paul, what are the barriers to fluoridation that you think, you know, we could face? Public opinion is going to have to be on board with the present system. The present system is that it's down for local government to decide. They go out for consultation and they are in a position, if they decide to go ahead, to impose, if you like, on the local water companies. Unfortunately, the water companies and the boundaries and the local authority boundaries are usually not coterminous so it doesn't work properly so that they then have to uh, go to the local authorities related to the risks of the particular water companies. They have to go through a system of debate and consultation etc and most people who are in favour of things don't attend meetings and those that are against do attend meetings and that tends to slant the reaction and the result, often, quite often, putting the local councils off. So what I'm hoping to do is to persuade the government that what they should do is use Public Health England, who will go to various areas and various water companies, rather than the local authorities, and say, by law, we're telling you, you put water fluoridation into your systems, as of now. That will take a while for them to do and progressively move around the countries. I want, for obvious reasons, for them to do it in areas where there's low deprivation. And it isn't the deprivation that's the problem, it's the education. When I was in East London, I'd go into the supermarket and see the sugar content on the shelves of biscuits, breads, uh, potato chips, the whole lots of things like that. Then I'd go back to, say, southwest London, Wimbledon or somewhere like that, and there's a complete reversal. The shelves were covered with meat, fruit, vegetables, etc. Uh, and the difficulty there is that the deprivation areas, therefore, because of diet and neglect, which we've covered, uh, will have higher uh, decay problems, which is why I would like the government to pick on those first. Yeah, absolutely. And 
you mentioned um, in answering my questions that in New Zealand um, they have therapists in schools. I mean, how do you feel that we should approach getting therapists into schools in the UK? To some degree, Sarah Hurley is doing that, and I don't just mean uh, therapists. We can have therapists, hygienists, and the whole um, gambit of people from the local dental surgeries if we can get them involved. Uh, and Sarah is running these programs uh, in nurseries, uh, so they're very, very young children, where they're going in with a team of people, which can include the dentists and the therapists, etc. Having government-supported therapy system would be an enormous cost, and uh, having to be set up, we'd have to set up dental clinics, etc., in all of the schools. And mm. I think the value for money for that just doesn't justify it. The reason it justified in New Zealand is they've had it there for 70, 80 or 90 years uh, and it has worked there. I'm hopeful that we can get it in and I was listening to Emma talking about teaching the kids etc. My own um, reaction is that kids and toothbrushes and toothpaste are really enthusiastically taken uh, she is right. It's got to be a game. They've got to really use on it. And if you've got any difficulty, it's the mess they create when they wave the toothpaste all around the room. I can see Emma smiling because she's obviously seen it. Yeah. Yeah, I think we've certainly all seen it in some capacity in the dental setting and all certainly hear the report uh, reports back from parents. Um, but yeah, no, thank you very much. And yeah, interesting, obviously, Sarah's already working on that and your thoughts on you know, how we can support more in, in school settings and nurseries. So thank you, Sir Paul Beresford, for that. Um, now, this is a question that I've received for Nigel. Will there be further children's initiatives planned later this year? We're going to be looking at this period um, which we now have with NHS dental practices having no output targets through to December and potentially through to next April to really look <coughs> at promoting uh, oral health during that time. We're also working uh, to look at the issue of high fluoride prescription toothpaste, which obviously has been very difficult for those that need them to get during the period of lockdown since the dentist has been required to uh, prescribe them. So we're looking at a campaign there, which will be going on for the rest of the year to promote uh, high fluoride toothpaste for those high caries, uh, risk children. Um, so this is a campaign that's going to be working both direct with the public and with um, dental care practitioners uh, to uh, try and lift those levels. So we see it as a really as a very key issue. Yeah. And how further can we push these messages out? I, I think it's, you know, participate in the campaigns, get on board, uh, follow the Oral Health Foundation social media accounts. Uh, I mean, across social media, we have a, uh, a following of something like 80,000 uh, followers. We, we actively put tweets out there which can be retweeted and Facebook posts that can be uh, passed on. Get some of those oral health messages uh, out there to the public. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I think you just go onto the Oral Health Foundation website and you can also find everything that, you know, you're working on and obviously Instagram and LinkedIn and you do a lot of posts, don't you, that we can obviously reshare. Yep, absolutely. Uh, go along to dentalhealth.org and uh, join up to the social media things and people really find them very useful communicating with their patient base as a, as a major thing. So this really spreads the message out there. Yeah, well, I certainly have through my ears. So thank you, <laughs> Nigel. <laughs> um, and now this is a question for Ferranti. Um, what areas of clinical research do you wish to undertake in MIH? I guess this is in the treatment as well. Yes, I think for the clinical research, I think that like anything else, we need to have a randomized control trial on that. At this moment, obviously, uh, we have anecdotal um, type of evidence on that. 
there is a, um, in the pedestrian industry, we have a um, now an interest group and uh, with regard to MIH and um, AI as well. So I think that, you know, obviously for each single unit, there might not be enough of those cases to run a randomized controlled trial. But if once we have, I think they you know we have a collaboration within the whole of the dentist team over there, then we might be able to run this kind of clinical trial with regard to that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, yeah, it's, it's a controlled trial, isn't it? And I guess it's mm -hmm. something that we need to be looking into and, and more and more evidence coming for us to all utilize. So thank you for Auntie. Um, I now have a question for Robert. Um, this is, how do you see the further developments of bioactive glass material in dentistry? Okay, we're, we're actively working on using the same technology um, in varnishes, uh, in dental fillings, uh, and in adhesives. Um, and in all these areas, uh, the, the, the bioactive, the fluoride bioactive glass technology has considerable promise. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, for example, we, we've done quite a lot of studies on uh, incorporating bio, uh, fluoride bioactive glasses into adhesives used for orthodontic resins to prevent white spot lesions. And certainly the laboratory data uh, seems to show it works very effectively. Um, um, we're actively engaging with a, a number of companies worldwide uh, to develop products in these areas. Mm -hmm. So watch this space. We'll be able to Certainly. <laughs> stay tuned on the E Academy, the Biomini Academy um, petition of the website. Um, I have another question here that I'd like to pose to Ferranti, and this is on, um, since you're treating, well, not at the moment, um, but <laughs> soon, I'm sure, again, treating lots of children. I mean, how do you feel um, we can treat kids using PPE um, level three, PPE level three? With difficulties. <laughs> I, I, I think anything that which has put a barrier between the child and the clinicians is always a difficult concept. However, there are many innovative ideas at this moment. If you think about some of the masks that we use have got different teddy bear and things like that and all that. So on the PPE3 with the full mask on and the soft full shield on as well, there are many designs that you can do, you know, innovatively and things like that. Of course, that this is a very early day of COVID and most people are treating children only in emergency cases. But when the lockdown, and I think that, you know, I don't know how the CDO and how the government is to look at that, where, whether, you know, the infectivity of the COVID-19 is warrant that everybody should have a fully tested fit test on the, on the fit mask. I mean, I personally have failed you know, two or three times on the so-called disposable mask myself. So it depending on how, what the infectivities of the COVID-19 and other kind of virus that we are thinking of as well. Um, I know that you know, anything I said, you know, anything in protective area is going to be difficult on treating children while they're awake and doing behavioral management. If they can't see you smiling, they can't see you, um, the long verbal thing, it's very difficult to communicate with them. However, I say that, you know, saying that children are used to Darth Vader, okay? <laughs> <laughs> so they may actually be very related to Darth Vader kind of concept rather than uh, the normal human face. I don't know, it's, it's a new area. Yeah, well, I think that's a good point. Actually, you've highlighted, I've seen a lot of face masks for children with animations on them and things like that. So maybe that's the way to, to move. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for Auntie. And uh, now we're coming to our conclusion. I think sadly we have to come to the end of this unique format of having a panel on a webinar today. And I'm sure you will all agree have covered some very interesting topics and have given us a broad view of the issues surrounding children's oral health and have given us a great deal to think about. So on behalf of Biomin, I would like to thank each panelist for joining and providing their expertise on the panel today and the take home I think really would be you know 
a key point is one thing that we need to consider is involving the mother in, in the children's oral health um, that has been highlighted um, throughout today. And to continue to learn um, on topics please do ensure uh, on Biomin, please do ensure you register or log into the Biomin Academy and complete the questionnaire to obtain your CPD if you wish. Aside from this webinar, there are a number of other training and e-learning resources available on this platform. So many of you may want to try this product and Biomin F for Kids is available in over 40 countries around the world through various distributors, all found on the Biomin website, where to buy. So thank you all so much for joining us today um, from around the world. We will be following up with a summary of um, event by, via email, which will also include any answers um, to any additional questions we were unable to get to today. So thank you from Barman and myself for joining us and goodbye.